Okay, this is a lecture about saddle point search algorithms. Saddles are extremely important in reaction rate theory, from RKM theory to harmonic transition state theory, and even later when we talk about free energy surfaces, we'll be concerned with saddle points on those free energy surfaces. Wigner and Eyring, who wrote this, uh, that says, the whole reaction rate depends only on the nature of the landscape near the, near the saddle, the nature of the valley floor, and the temperature. It has practically nothing to do with the intervening country. And many papers spend a lot of time talking about the actual route that a molecular simulation trajectory takes on its way up to the transition state and on over the barrier. Uh, but the reality is that the rate that we observe is primarily just dependent on the characteristics of that saddle point and the characteristics of the reactant state. And so that's really the reason that so much work in reaction rate theory has been aimed at developing computational methods to define these saddles. The potential energy surface, as we've already talked about, is very high dimensional. So this is a really challenging area, and we would like to have very robust methods to go out and find a diverse collection of saddle points. There are four classes of methods for finding saddle points. One of them that I think is somewhat underrated in how valuable it is, if you have chemical intuition and you know what kind of transition state you're looking for, this of course is a great way to prepare an initial guess. And then the other three methods on this list, ways of improving that initial guess coordinate driving, it works very well if you have a fairly good understanding of the mechanism and you know which coordinate to drive. If you don't, it can be somewhat of a disaster. A nudged elastic band also requires some a priori understanding of the mechanism because you have to specify the reactants and the products and the atom by atom correspondence between those two states. The method of Sir Jan and Miller, searching for transition states guided by the local slope and curvature on the potential energy surface, they have the ability to discover things that you, you didn't expect. So many of these algorithms, and in practice chemical intuition as well, are used to get you an initial guess that's close to the transition state, close enough that you can use newton raphson to refine that guess and hone in on the actual transition state structure. The energy landscape is the energy as a function of coordinate x plus some displacement away from x, so x stands for the current position, and this is an unknown displacement. This is, and the energy at the new position should be the energy at the place where I Taylor expanded, times the displacement dotted into the gradient, plus one half of the displacement dotted into the Hessian matrix. The gradient here and the Hessian are evaluated at this location x. Now the goal is to choose this step, this delta x, to make the gradient zero at the new location. In order to do that, we solve for the gradient at the new location. That's going to be the gradient at the old location plus the Hessian dotted into the displacement. And we want to set all of that equal to zero. We diagonalize the Hessian. We're going to do that because we're going to need a pseudo inverse. The Hessian has a null space, and so you can't really invert this guy. Diagonalization now will give me a matrix of row eigenvectors with the Hessian dotted into the matrix of column eigenvectors gives me this lambda matrix. This is the matrix of eigenvalues. If I'm not working in mass weighted coordinates, then these won't actually be frequencies. But also it's, it's nice in some cases to make all the masses the same, and then the problem is a little bit less ill-conditioned in terms of the convergence. Define a gradient vector in the eigenvector basis, and that's this, this operation here. We're going to define a displacement in the eigenvector basis, and that's this operation here. And now we can convert everything into this simple equation by multiplying by the eigenvector matrix on the left and inserting u, u dagger. So u is a unitary matrix here because the Hessian is symmetric. And if we take u, u dagger, that just gives me i. So I can insert this in the equation anywhere I like. And when I do that, I recover this simple expression. This is my gradient in the eigenvector basis, my diagonal matrix of force constants and the vector of displacements in the eigenvector basis. And that should still be equal to the zero vector. Now, some of these lambda i's are zero. I need to invert this thing carefully. For all of the force constants that are not zero, we're going to take the displacement along that direction, and we're going to just write it in terms of the usual gamma i over lambda i with a minus sign. So that's just solving this equation decoupled. Then we also have some force constants that are going to be zero. Those correspond, for example, to translations and rotations. This kind of expression would really just result in a zero divided by zero here because we don't have any forces associated with the rotations and translations either. We just set the displacements along those modes to be equal to zero. And this is a this is basically a way of constructing the pseudo inverse. So this is the displacement resolved into the contributions from each eigenvector. Uh, and the displacements along those eigenvectors. 
So the algorithm really looks like this in practice. You take the current location, you compute the gradient, you compute the Hessian, you use those with the pseudo inverse to get the displacement in the eigenvector basis, and then you use that to get a displacement in the Cartesian basis, you update the position, and you go back and you do the whole process again. This is a, a rather quickly converging algorithm. However, you, you have to be within a, a rather small zone around the actual saddle point or else things will go the wrong way. This is depicting a saddle point here and a little zone of convergence. And if we start within that zone, then things converge pretty quickly to this saddle. In practice, it's harder and harder to find that zone of convergence as the number of degrees of freedom go up with an initial guess. You really run into troubles if you, what defines this zone is more or less the region in which the one negative force constant corresponds to the reaction coordinate that guides you uphill along this one direction and downhill along all the others. Well, if there are many, many other degrees of freedom other than your reaction coordinate, then you have to get close enough to the actual transition state that all of those other degrees of freedom have positive force constants. And that's a very, very small space to hit as the number of modes gets higher and higher. newton raphson if you can start out close enough, it converges quite quickly. It has a quadratic convergence property, and that basically means that the digits of accuracy double with each iteration of the algorithm. Uh, if you plotted the log of the distance from the actual saddle versus the number of iterations, you would see something dropping faster than a line here. This would be dropping like this. Quadratic convergence looks like that.